I'm sure that you've all heard the story, one of those preacher stories that I'm positive is not true, but some preacher needed a, an illustration to begin his sermon, so he made it up. I've heard it 20 times probably over. But it's the story of a little boy in a Sunday school class who, after the lesson, he picked up a clean sheet of paper and some crayons, and he began to feverishly draw so much that it caught the teacher's attention. So the teacher walked over to him and asked him what he was drawing. So the boy proudly announced that he was drawing a picture of God. And the Sunday school teacher chuckled and asked him how he could do that, reminding him what the Bible says, no one has seen God at any time. We don't know what he looks like, he says. And the boy excitedly returned to his drawing, and he said, well, they'll know what he looks like when I'm done drawing this picture of him. The scripture teaches that no one has seen the Father at any time, but that Jesus is the sufficient picture of the Godhead. We're such visual creatures that we cannot really even understand that idea that we never get to see the Father, we see Jesus. To some, you're actually disappointed when you might learn something like that, as taught in Scripture, that you only get to see Jesus, but it's there in Scripture. God is spirit, the Bible says. Without physical eyes, yet he sees. Without actual hands, but he works. Without brain synapses or spinal cord, yet he thinks and he, he knows all. With all of that, there really is no description that the Bible gives of God except in the names and the titles by which he reveals himself to us in the word of God. And we learn a, a bit more about his attributes and about his nature by how he introduces himself to his creation, be it Elohim, Jehovah, Adonai, or any of the other names or titles that we've studied over the past few months. On this first Sunday evening of the year, I felt it was appropriate to present a title of God that points out and affirms that God is timeless, he is eternal, and he is unaffected by the shifting sands of this world. This title, it's only revealed to one person throughout the entirety of the word of God. It's only recorded by one person in scripture. And he uses it several times to describe Jehovah. To Daniel, in a dream, the judge over all humanity and civilizations is given this name, the Ancient of Days. I mean, that name is just perfectly poetic and magnificent. The Ancient of Days. It's tucked deep within a very difficult passage of Scripture that I hope to walk us through in some ways this evening. If you were to ask most kids who their favorite Bible character is, I think probably David, Joseph, Esther, and Daniel would probably be pretty high up on their list. Uh, each had and lived exciting and inviting lives that were filled with the grace of God, filled with adventures, and honestly, the majority of them are larger than life stories that it's just fun for kids to imagine. When I was a kid, I would have answered Daniel, and he would still probably make my top three. But let's be honest, if you look in the book of Daniel, Half of the book of Daniel gets super confusing really fast. Once you flip through Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand to eat traditional Jewish foods instead of the Babylonian in chapter 1. And once you flip past the fiery furnace of chapter 3 where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were sent since they wouldn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And once you pass over the writing on the wall in Daniel chapter 5 and Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6, you are plunged headlong into six chapters, 7 through 12, filled with visions and prophecies that are confusing at least and intimidating to study at best. Well, Ancient of Days, that title comes to us right at the cusp of all of that, all of the difficulties of the book of Daniel it's introduced to us right there in chapter 7. Were we to place chapter 7 chronologically in the book of Daniel, it would probably fit between Nebuchadnezzar's lunacy in Daniel chapter 4 and Belshazzar's feast that gets interrupted by the handwriting on the wall in chapter 8. That's because the dream of Daniel's takes place the first year of Belshazzar's reign, before Darius's reign, and before Daniel's throne in the lion's den 
even though that's recorded in Daniel chapter 6. Well, Daniel served under three administrations, two separate empires. Think of that for just a moment. Kings pass off the scene. New ones come to power, either through succession or subjugation, but Daniel remains a constant, always bending the attention of the king to hear the will of the one true God. In our day and age, to find someone in our nation who serves under a Democratic and a Republican president is a fairly rare thing. But Daniel, he remained advisor to the king even after conquests of previous power. When empires shifted, he still remained one of the advisors to the new king. You can definitely see that that is God's hand at work in Daniel's life making sure that the people of God are safe to some degree because of Daniel being in a place of power. In the first year of the second king that Daniel served under, Belshazzar, Daniel had a dream. And the whole of chapter 7 is the record of that dream. So read with me again verse 1 of Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. I can just kind of see it. He wakes up in the middle of the night, and immediately after having this dream, he begins scratching out all the main points of this dream for his memory's sake, and maybe for some instruction for those that God has given him authority over. And in this dream, I'll just kind of give you the vague overview of this dream. From the midst of what Scripture calls the great sea, rose four extraordinary creatures, each in succession, one right after the other, the next seeming to conquer the one before it. The first beast is introduced to us, and he is likened to a winged lion, but its wings are quickly plucked off, and it's made to stand up like a man. The second beast was a slouched bear that was gnawing on ribs And it's given the order to arise and devour much flesh. The third beast was like a four-headed, four-winged leopard that reigned wherever it landed. The fourth and final beast was the most terrible of them all. It wasn't even likened to any kind of animal. There is no beast on earth we could understand that even comes close to how terrible this thing is. It's described as being exceedingly strong, having huge iron teeth, bronze nails or talons, and ten horns that it uses to destroy all that's left from all the other beasts that had gone before it. Daniel looks closer in the dream at this beast, and he sees another little horn amongst the ten horns now growing up where three of the original ten had been pulled out from their root. This little horn, it gets really weird here, has eyes like a man. And it begins to scream out arrogant, pompous taunts at the people of God. I want you to know, my goal tonight is to not play interpreter of Daniel's dream. Um, That's what Daniel does for a living. He interprets dreams, and even he struggled with the meaning of it all. Or at least that's what verses 15 through 16 says. He says, I, Daniel, in verse 15, I was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, again, in my dream, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of all these things. So I want you to understand, I am not so arrogant to say that I understand and have the best interpretation of all this because Daniel himself, who saw it with his own eyes, had no idea what was going on except someone enlightened him a bit. And even still, I don't think he understood it completely because he's still troubled at the meaning of it. So what I'll do tonight is I'll only recap what Daniel understands the dream to mean based upon some help that he receives in verses 15 through 27, because there is one standing by in the dream who does give him the reasoning behind it. He says that these four beasts represent different kings or empires, each that ruled, reigned, and then was conquered by the next empire. The fourth beast with the ten horns 
it's a little different from the others because it represents an empire of 10 kings with an additional one who will come up after the others pass away. And that ruler, which that little horn represents, is more vile than all the others who would come before him. It even declared this little horn of this fourth kingdom. It declared war on the saints of God. And scripture says that it even came close to conquering the saints in verse 21. I'm going to give you an educated hypothesis hypothesis as to which empires these are, but I I don't want us to get hung up on history and the prophecy of all of this. What I think would be more beneficial to us tonight is to use the characteristics of each of these beasts, each of these empires that are represented here to describe mankind. And as we describe mankind and all of its treachery and treason, we'll get a better understanding of who the Ancient of Days is. So when we do this, we have to understand that each of these beasts, they represent humanity. Power-seeking humanity that thrives off its own self-importance and the suffering of others. In very 30,000 feet up in the air kind of point of view, that's what this is. Yes, individual empires, and yes, they have a real meaning and a real context here. But overall, each of them represent tyrants and those who want to rule over others. They are the worst of humanity, if we could think of it in those ways. These empires, they're, they're similar to that very first great civilization that Scripture tells us about, the Babel, the Tower of Babel. Those that they sought to live independently of God. And they set their entire nation to building a tower to heaven. They wanted the reward of heaven. They wanted to get to heaven without the restraints or the laws of God. And that is, in short, what every secular society's goal is, to have a utopia, to have a paradise devoid of God's reign, to do things their way and still have the blessings of the Almighty upon them. And that's not how God created us. This first beast showcases the arrogance of humanity. It's a sign, it's sign of a plucked winged lion made to walk like a man is remarkably similar to the account of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon that Daniel 4 tells us about. Fascinated with the might of his own kingdom and the power in his own hand, We see or we read in Daniel chapter 4 verse 30 that Nebuchadnezzar spoke to himself saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, the voice of God. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Immediately, Nebuchadnezzar goes insane. He runs out into the fields. He lives there for a prolonged period of time, so long to where his hair grows incredibly long and it's likened to feathers of an animal, of a, of a bird, and his fingernails grew as long as talons. He eats grass like a beast of the field. And finally, reason returns to him. He looks to God. He recognizes God as the ruler of all. And he's brought back into reigning the kingdom more sane than he ever had been before. That's the picture. This empire of Babylon who Nebuchadnezzar was. This winged lion that had been plucked from his greatness. Made to stand like an animal. Made to stand like a man. And been reinstated back there. But we see in this picture the arrogance of mankind. We are arrogant. We look at our little empires, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, and we begin to believe the lie. Is not this great house that I have built by my power for my honor? And we do the same with our vehicles. Is not this vehicle my vehicle? which I have purchased by the sweat of my own brow, with my own money, and I deserve it. We do it with our jobs. We do it with our families. We think that we are owed the things that God blesses us with, and we are arrogant. That's this first beast, a picture of the arrogance of mankind. 
The second beast, this lopsided bear-like animal, displays the destruction of mankind if left to our own devices. The destructive nature of mankind, probably better said. The empire of the Persians, formerly the Medes and the Persians, which may be why the bear is lopsided, Medes and Persians, and the Persians won out, was marked by its destruction. All empires during this era, they could have had this said of them, that they were destructive empires. But in the biblical, in the biblical account, just look at the story of Esther and of King Ahasuerus, or as you may have in your translation of Scripture, Xerxes. Xerxes is careless. He's the ruler of the Persians, and he is destructive in his own life. And he treats his own wife, Vashti, as just a possession to be told what to do. And he calls for one night when he is drunk with his friends to parade her in all of her beauty in front of him. There's some obvious immorality going on here, and Vashti refuses to come into that immoral den. And when she refused to take part in the debauchery, he divorces her. He held a perverted beauty pageant that we have grossly misconstrued in our culture to be something that's amazing and Miss Persia. Uh, it wasn't pretty. Esther is picked of the hundreds of other girls that Xerxes sleeps with. And then, if you read just the next chapter over, after Xerxes and Esther's marriage, you'll realize that Xerxes actually opened up another round of beauty pageant entries so that he could slake his own lust and have more wives and a bigger harem. Persia, humanity, destructive. From our addictions to our abuse of others, our society, and honestly, many of us personally, we have left a field of human wreckage behind us when we've done only what we want to do or are attracted to. We are reckless and destructive, wanting to live our way instead of go the path that God has laid for us. The third beast. It's described as the four-headed, four-winged leopard. It may very well be Greece. Once Alexander the Great died, he dies in a drunken stupor. He splits his Greek empire among his four generals so that none could ever obtain his level of greatness, historians tell us, was his reasoning. And what this empire or what this beast teaches us is the divisions among mankind. We are divided. If there is one aspect of the curse of sin that is incredibly evident every second of our day, it's that humanity is divided. It doesn't matter how many kumbaya songs we want to sing and, and grab hands and sing around a, a circle of people, we are divided. We live in a polarized society where we, yes, even we Christians, we lack in loving our enemies. We lack loving those who have a different, a different political persuasion than we do. We lack even loving those whom we have slight disagreements about sports teams and colleges with. We are divided thousands and thousands of times over. And it wasn't supposed to be this way. There wasn't supposed to be these divisions. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect harmony perfect unity until sin drove this wedge between them. And immediately, as soon as they sin and they're confronted by God with their sin, they begin to blame each other for their own faults, for their own failures, for their own sins. Is there a, a problem in your marriage? Is, is there a division amongst you and your spouse? Let me tell you, it's because sin has crept in. We are divided because of the fall. The fourth and the final beast, this iron-teethed, bronzed-nailed, multi-horned, incredibly strong beast. It may very well be the Roman Empire that comes after Greece. And it displays the fact that mankind is utterly profane. Utterly profane. Twice it's said of this little horn that springs up among the other ten that it boasted profane and pompous taunts against God and his people. 
It is so profane that it turns its cursing into actual persecution of the saints. Spewing curses all the while, killing Christians. And we learn from this final beast that mankind is profane. We hear it in the majority of movies, in the lyrics of most top ten charted songs, and in the aisle over at the grocery store. We are a people who thumb our noses at the holiness of God. We taunt him with our crassness and our sexual innuendos. We are vile and profane. That's who we are. We, mankind, humanity as a whole, we are arrogant, destructive, divided, and profane. But that's only half of Daniel's dream. That's not the end of it. This vision, while it involves these crude beasts, it's not about them, nor the empire's past, present, or future that they represent. The vision, the dream that Daniel realizes that first year of Belshazzar's reign is all about the ancient of days. These empires, they're all going to meet the same end as that first civilization, Babel. Babel. They want to rule apart from God. They want paradise without God's principles. Then there is nothing left for them but utter confusion and ultimate fall. That is all that is left for any empire, any nation, devoid of God and his principles. Confusion and failure. After each of these beasts come up from the great sea, a setting is then right for the Ancient of Days to take his place. Read with me, verse 9, as Daniel records or recounts the vision again. I watched till thrones were put in place. A courtroom scene is gathering around these four beasts. And who is ruling in this court? He goes on in verse 9 and says, And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Now let's just stop. This is a symbolic picture of God on the throne. This isn't really God. This is a picture of God on the throne. We're introduced to him as the judge of all peoples and all nations, all empires and all tyrants. He is the ancient of days. He has the wisdom of the ancients at his disposal, which is what that means. And he has the eternality of all days in his hand. While the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the beast wrought chaos in their time, his throne never faltered once. The pure white of the judge's garments and hair speaks to his righteousness. He is purely right. There's not a speck of sin on him or in him. Take a look at his throne. Just look at the description of just his throne in verse 9. It's engulfed in flame, but never consumed, which speaks of his might. It has wheels. His throne has wheels or a wheel. Think about that for a moment. I don't know about your understanding of thrones. I'm definitely not a, pro a professional on this, but they don't usually have wheels on them. Ezekiel testifies of this kind of throne that God sits upon too. It's always moving, perpetually employed in his ruling. This ancient of days isn't just some aloof monarch attached or detached from his people. He's involved in their life, continually working his goodwill. And man is the ancient of days about to do a good work. Verse 10, as court is called in session, it's not a gavel, but a fiery stream issues and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. 
The judge is about to sentence a righteous judgment on that shrimp of a horn who murdered his people. That beast is brought squealing before him, spewing empty threats all the while. In verse 11, I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their do dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. The truth of this vision is the Ancient of Days wins. We win. You need more proof of that? Read on, verse 13. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. He is forever ruling, never faltering, inviting us to serve alongside the Ancient of Days. That's the miracle of miracles of all of this. We have learned about humanity if left to themselves, and we've also been taught about the rightness or the holiness of the Ancient of Days. But the miracle of the vision is that the Ancient of Days, the righteous judge, wants us, creatures of the dirt, to rule and reign alongside and under him. Verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. This world so infatuated with the next political election and season that I hate we're about to go into, needs to learn that there is a ruler who you can't vote out of office. There is a king who has never stopped reigning, and there is an enemy who will be destroyed and his power, his might, his reigning will be dispersed among those who have followed him. And he has chosen us to rule and reign, joint heirs with the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days. He is yesterday, today, forever the same.